All right, so uh, thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, this is pretty crude. It actually gets much more colorful further down, but I, I had to stop at two minutes. Uh, so this is a pretty accurate representation of how the millennial generation, which also happens to be the single largest American generation ever, almost 100 million people, basically thinks about what is known as big banks. So the too big to fail reference is, or the, this, this is a very perfect setting for it because these people that are now up to 35 years old or so basically think that big banks screwed their parents. So I'll rip through my sort of company presentation as quickly as I can. So there could actually be a conversation and it doesn't look like too much of a commercial, but there's a lot of really fun stats to go with this video. So this is a Viacom um, sponsored study of about 10,000 millennials. So this is a statistically significant sample and the top four leading American banks are among the top 10 least loved brands. So you can guess who they are, but uh, that's a pretty good stat. Another one is six out of 10 or more do not have a credit card. There's an interesting wrinkle on it. Some do, but think they don't. They use it like a debit card. They charge a tab and pay it off at the end of the month. 44% have, this is not zero interest credit cards, but zero interest in using credit cards, just not interested in it at all. And 60% primarily use debit cards because a debit card is basically an API to your bank account. You can swipe and you get access, but you settle immediately. And 73% uh, would be more excited about a new financial product from the likes of Google and Apple and Square and, and such. So are these people crazy? What's wrong with them? You know, don't you need a credit card to succeed in life? This is certainly what my generation was taught and I'm not that much older than the millennials. So two very clear reasons for it. Number one, they were right there in 2008 in the most impressionable time in their life and they watched their parents sell their houses short and uh, get their credit cards cut up and their credit lines reduced. So it was a tough time and they got to witness it firsthand. And uh, they're smart. They are on social media. They're looking and talking all the time about all the offers they get in the mail and they realize that it's kind of a sucker's game. If you got a in-store issued credit card that has a same as cash, 0%, everything's amazing until you miss your first payment and it compounds from the day of purchase and then you're really screwed, not to sort of get too far into the South Park vernacular, they know it's probably too good to be true. So this was all kind of, I was reading all these stats and going, wow, you know, we, we really didn't do a good enough job at PayPal, which I had a hand in years ago, to sort of fix this whole mess. And uh, four years ago, I basically started with this premise that you can take the FICO score, which is the uh, Fair Isaacs company right in my backyard that defined how Americans get credit many, many years ago and do better. FICO is a brilliant collection of formulas, but it doesn't update quickly enough and the world changes for the 18 to 34 year olds much faster than it used to in the 80s when they standardized on a FICO score. So this is a very quick demonstration of how our product works. I'll tell you what it is, but this woman is buying a mattress and uh, she is applying for a credit. This is an installment loan. She's putting in five pieces of information that she knows top of her mind. She gets text to the security code and she is now choosing her own terms and it's done. She just bought a mattress. So this is our product live online. We launched this a couple of years ago after spending a few years trying to build a replacement for the credit score. This person has never signed up for a firm. She encountered this product as an option at a checkout at an online retailer and the product that was offered to her is essentially take this $1,000 mattress from Casper, one of our partners right here in New York City, and uh, split it into six payments. The most important feature that convinced her the proverbial millennial who does not have a credit card, does not want a credit card to go with a firm, is that everything is priced in. The cost of ownership, the interest rate, everything's expressed in dollar terms. It's spelled out and it's a simple interest loan and there are no fees of any kind. If she misses a payment, we call her and remind her to do it. That's, that's, the, that's the stick in the equation. So this taken off like a wildfire, even though you would think, why in the world would people apply for credit if they can just get a credit card? Well, they don't have credit cards, they don't want credit cards but they seem to really enjoy this. One of the uh, best stats I have to offer on the success of this product so far is every time a retailer online installs this product, adds it to their checkout counter, they see about 30% incremental sales begin overnight. 
because people actually like the transparency. Um, so, thanks for getting back, back it up. We also figured out a way, despite not having fees and various other predatory features, we figured out how to make it cost less than credit card. The cost of ownership is priced in, in part because of the simple interest loan, in part because the retailers with the margin to support it are very happy to subsidize the loan to the consumer. Um, our approvals are way better. So the proprietary math behind scoring this credit, which happens instantaneously, is good enough to allow people with zero acceptance by traditional banks, which is typically students, new immigrants, of which I was one at some point, to get, normally they get no credit at all in the system, we are able to approve more than three out of 10, and everywhere else we're, we do just as well. Um, we built it for millennials because we thought this was going to be a great enabler of transactions and commerce in the world of uh, young people, but even though they're the largest demographic that we serve, it turns out that Gen Xers and Boomers are just as fed up with the, I don't understand what's in my credit card fine print, and so we're now seeing roughly a third, a third, a third by the last three generation utilizing this product. Um, then for motor score, for those of you who don't know, is the difference between people who will recommend you to their friends minus those that will actively discourage you. We have 70% net promoter score, which is pretty spectacular. My own alma mater, PayPal, I think is in the 50s. Amex is 45. HSBC is negative 10, I think. It's a good comparison. Um, Apple is 66, which is the sort of the North Star of customer satisfaction. Um, we just announced this, and I promise you I'll spare you the commercial, but we have seen so much market pull for this product that we went from being strictly online to offering the product offline and telesales in store, so there's sort of a huge amount of demand for this kind of stuff. Um, we're probably going to try to reinvent a credit card as the card physical version of it itself. Interesting sort of way to frame the whole credit card versus not credit card idea is the physical product itself is just an API to your money. Like the guts underneath it, the math or the, the logic that drives the decisioning is pretty stupid and has been pretty stupid for a very long time. There's a really good chance the software will eat that one as well per Mark Andreessen's prescription. Um, and uh, I'll leave you with a video which we just shot. This is obviously a TV commercial style, what the affirm enabled lifestyle looks like but uh, there's some clues as to where we're going as a product, and I will uh, stop advertising and hopefully answer some good questions. indulging by uh, promotions. Thank you. Um, I wanted you all to see that. I saw this. Thank you, Max. I saw this presentation, I think, in a different incarnation back in March and then again in the summer. I thought it was one of the most provocative uh, real shifts potentially in the way we get credit. And so I wanted to have a conversation, and I, I thought these guys could have a chance on goal to ask you about it as well. 
But I want to start with this. One of the things that's so interesting, and I don't think we, you got into it a little bit in this presentation, is in how you have effectively tried to rewrite the FICO score yep. in terms of the algorithm and what is in it. And so when you look at the FICO score today that every bank and every credit, everything uh, relies on, what is it that you have done? What, what are you looking at that's different than the banks when you say now three out of 10 are gonna actually get the loan that the banks wouldn't give them? So two things. One, no one knows what's in the FICO score. They publish the uh, top seven things that influence it, but the math is secret, otherwise the story goes, you'd be able to game it. So you don't really wanna, wanna know what's inside. Um, so the interesting thing is that everybody always looks for the secret sauce. Like, well, what is that thing that makes you guys so much better at assessing credit? And there is no secret sauce. The secret sauce is actually in the systems that rebuild the models every day. So the way the FICO score works is it updates roughly every quarter, every half a year. And in the gig economy and in going from being a student to being a worker, it's just not reasonable to update your score every quarter, every year. What we do is we watch our own volume of transactions and we take 100% of the risk. So we, we are an unbalanced sheet lender and watch what works, what doesn't, what sort of a person winds up paying us back. The secret sauce, if you sort of must delve into it, actually exists in a fairly exciting detail on the anti-fraud side. So of the people that say, I have the money and I'll pay you back, some are lying to themselves and some are capable of repaying and we lend to those and we try to tell the ones that are lying to themselves, don't do it. But the ones that are lying to us are the most fascinating characters because they're not really Andrew Ross Orkins, they're someone in Bulgaria pretending to be you. And the identity theft and the identity verification, that stuff has a lot of really cool secret sauce. And there's a million different tricks that we've come up with over the last 20 years to figure this out. But, but when you think about, I mean, you are effectively offering credit on the spot. Yeah. People are walking out with the product. No questions asked, effectively. I mean, five questions asked. Five questions asked. You know where they live ostensibly, but almost not. We, we know where they're shipping the product. You know where they're shipping the product, and that's it. Uh, we know their mobile number. So one of the fundamental tenets that we started the score with, actually, maybe this, this is a secret sauce. So at PayPal, 15 years ago now, more than that, we sort of had this insight, your identity is your email. And these days, it's like, of course you log in with your identity, but I think PayPal was actually one of the very first websites where you logged in with your email account. It used to be, give us your email, give us your username, give us your full name, it's like, you are your email. And that's not true anymore. You are your mobile number. Between the Number Portability Act and just the fact that it's easier to remember numbers forever, your social security number is actually kind of worthless. What's really valuable to know who you are is your mobile number. So we ask for your mobile number, and from that we can gather an enormous amount of information about you very quickly and verify that you are who you say you are, and from that we can in fact pick up a lot of other interesting underwriting signals. Let me just ask you about trust. Um, and we're gonna have James Gorman here from Morgan Stanley, and we're gonna have Gary Cohn here from Goldman Sachs a little bit later. You made the argument that millennials don't trust big banks, and, and but those guys are not commercial banks, so it may be a little bit different, but do you look at this as a generational issue? Do you look at this as a forever issue? Do you say to yourself that the banks can effectively regain the trust, that trust is lost forever? What you, you've spent a lot of time surveying a lot of the consumers that participate. What, what is the thinking? It seems, and I'm a little bit outside of the generation, so I, I speak for my customers, but only so much, that there's a fair amount of awareness of the world in the millennial generation. People that don't really remember what life was like without Twitter, without news being instant, the sense of where I am in the world is much stronger, and the sense of fairness, sense of what's right and what's wrong is significantly more than sort of cynical me and the people who came before me. And so in that lives this notion of, well, yeah, it was pure capitalist action that drove banks to behave certain ways during the crisis, but that's not okay. You know, look at poor starving children in Africa, the stuff that my mom used to tell me to make me eat. That seems to actually resonate with people for real this time. And so I'm not sure the banks can regain the trust very quickly. They probably can by behaving better at some point, and I'm not sure they even behave poorly, but the trust is not there right now. Long term, what happens to an firm? Does a firm get uh, acquired by a big bank? that wants to use this brand to get to millennials? Do you become an independent company that ends up buying a big bank? What happens? I can only speak to what I want to do. It's one of these things where it's hard to predict what will happen to one. Um, it certainly would be odd if a big bank bought a firm, at least that doesn't figure into my self-constructed narrative. But 
What I do think these millennial customers of ours need over time is a collection of products that we don't currently offer and we should. At some point you graduate from buying mattresses and setting up your first kitchen to needing more. And at some point it's home ownership or car ownership and all those products need to exist. And if we are able to establish a relationship with these people that they trust, then we should be offering those products. And that may or may not include deposit services, which of course is where you kind of become a bank and right. that becomes quite, quite interesting. Okay, why don't we open up for questions? Uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of this provoked some thought in the room. Uh, Ma'am, in the back. Yeah. Hi, uh, you opened with not just uh, talking about bank deposits, but actually about investments. And millennials are currently investing through robo-advisors. Uh, because they don't trust investment professionals and in fact investment professionals are on average age 56 so they don't reflect who they are so my question is have you looked at that as a potential addition to your platform um, certainly so we, I, I've I've been looking at robo advising and I've been trying to think about it the interesting thing about robo advising and I think this will play itself out in the market in interesting ways I'm not yet sure there is a sustainable financial model for robo-advisors because the reason the age, the average age of a financial advisor reflects the, the average age of the financial advisor's customer base and those are the people that have earned in excess of a million dollars of personal net worth or something along those lines and it's hard to imagine yourself being a millionaire when you are 21 but you are smart and you're tracking things on Twitter and you want to invest in a stock market and so my guess is that the robo-advisor companies are actually the ones that are going to get acquired by the big banks that, uh, that you're, you're speaking of because they need the functionality to attract these customers early and as they graduate into having a lot more net worth, they need the personal attention. My, my current relationship with my customers is largely around purchasing and ownership and payments. At some point, they're going to need the service. I'm certainly going to figure out a way to offer it to them. Let's sneak in one more question. Yeah. I don't know if you've been at it this long enough, but what is your default rate on these uh, people who are three, th three out of 10 were not accepted by the banks and that you accepted? Um, we try hard not to rattle off any stats, but uh, you would be amazed how low it is. It, it is, uh, the three out of 10, just to sort of frame it correctly, is not that we go out and say, wow, this person might default, but we'll lend to them anyway, let's see what happens. It's the, in the group of people that have the FICO score of 590, live people like me that started their first company in college, missed three payments, went way below, and never missed a payment ever since. And the FICO score, in my case, took seven years to get back up to 700 something. But I was a fantastic risk going forward, and our ability is to pick off those people in that range. We gotta leave it there. Max Levchin, thank you. Thank you for the questions. We're gonna take a quick coffee break. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with James Gorman, Ginny Rometty.